Hi, and welcome to Dr. V's AP Chemistry webcast. In this webcast, we're going to be talking about collision theory and how it affects reaction rates or how we can use it to explain reaction rates and tie that into potential energy diagrams for reactions as well. So what do we want to accomplish in this webcast? Well, first, I want to introduce collision theory. That's the main point of this whole webcast. And as we're doing that, I want to discuss potential energy diagrams and activation energy. And these are important ideas that tie back into collision theory. And finally, describe how catalysts affect reaction rates, right? This is a whole unit on kinetics and collision theory is what we use to explain and make predictions about reaction rates. So this is all really important information. It's collision theory. So I think it won't come as a surprise to anyone that it involves collisions. The particles must collide in order to react. Reactant particles must hit each other in order to make new materials. But that's not enough. Simply colliding does not mean we're going to get a reaction. There are two conditions that must be met in order to get the products. So as we said, molecules must collide in order to react, but there are two conditions. And the first condition is that the particles must collide with the correct orientation. So let's look at some visual examples of that. Let's think about the reaction A plus BC. And when they react, they form AB and C. So when the A atom comes in and hits the BC molecule on the B side of it, the reaction can occur, making the AB molecule, and then the C goes flying off. But the orientation is really, really important. So if my BC molecule is rotated so that now the A atom is going to collide with the C side, the reaction won't occur. So that's what we mean when we say particles must collide with the correct orientation. When the A atom hits the B side of the BC molecule, the reaction can take place. When the A atom hits the C side of the B molecule, or if it were to come in at some other angle, no reaction occurs. And so only the one orientation works, other orientations don't. The details of the correct orientation are unique to each reaction. And usually AP chemistry students are asked to predict that unless it's a very, very simple situation, right? So the particles must collide in order to react. There's a second condition that also has to be met. They must collide with enough energy, right? So if we go back to our reaction A plus BC, right? If A is moving really, really slowly, it might hit with the right orientation, but if it doesn't have enough energy, nothing's going to happen. They're just going to separate. But if the molecules are moving faster and they have more energy, the reaction actually can take place. It's a little slow here, but that's the idea. The particles need to collide with enough energy that they can break the bonds and form new bonds. So when A collides with B, we need to form a new bond between A and B and break the bond between B and C. So the amount of energy the particles need to have when they're colliding is called the activation energy. There's a minimum energy needed in order for the reaction to take place. That's called, like I said, the activation energy. That's a really important term. I should also mention it's a minimum. I need to meet or exceed that minimum requirement. Either I had enough energy or more, or I don't. This leads us to the idea of an effective collision. An effective collision leads to a reaction, leads to new products. But in order for that to happen, the particles need to collide with the correct orientation and enough energy. Both criteria need to be met, or it's an ineffective collision and the particles will just separate and no reaction will occur. So we can think of bowling as an analogy. Either the bowling ball moves down the center of the lane or it doesn't. Either the bowling ball hits the pins with enough energy to knock them over or it doesn't. Both conditions need to be met if you want to knock over most of the pins. So this is a nice time to bring in potential energy diagrams. You've probably seen these before, but if you haven't, they're a really useful visual way of showing the energetics of a reaction. So it shows the relative energies of the reactants and the products, all right? And in this particular reaction, the reactants are higher in energy than the products. So this is an exothermic process that I'm showing here. And so we can show the delta H value, the difference in energy between the products and the reactants, right? And it's always, determined from the products minus the reactants. Okay, now we can actually put a lot of information and pull a lot of information out of these potential energy diagrams. One thing we can show with these is the activation energy, that minimum energy required for the reaction to occur. We call the peak of this curve the transition state. And the activation energy can be shown on the potential energy diagrams because it's the gap between the reactants 
and the transition state. So we can show that with an arrow that I label EA. We can do it for the reverse reaction as well, but right now I'm doing it for the forward reaction. Now at the transition state, that's where all the real chemistry is happening. The species present at the transition state is referred to as the activated complex. This is where I'm breaking the bonds I don't want and forming the new bonds that I do want to make for the products. And this is a high energy state. If I don't have enough energy to make this, the reaction can occur. So let's tie this back into collision theory. The basic premise behind collision theory in terms of predicting reaction rates is that when you have more collisions between the reactant particles, you're going to speed up the rate. Because if you have more collisions, a greater number of those collisions will be effective. So if you need to make a reaction go faster, you have several choices. You could increase the temperature. The particles are moving more quickly. They have a higher average speed, so there'll be more possible collisions between the reactant particles. And more of them are likely to have enough kinetic energy to overcome that activation energy minimum. We could also increase the concentration. Again, there'll be more reactant particles, more particles, so more collisions, faster reaction. And we can also increase the surface area if there's a solid involved in the reactant, because more particles would be exposed at the surface, so you could have more collisions between the particles at the surface of the solid and whatever it's reacting with. Similarly, if we decrease the temperature, decrease the concentration of reactants, or had a smaller surface area of any solids, that would lead to slower reactions. I wanted to explore the relationship between temperature and rate a little bit more. As we just said, when we increase the temperature, the reaction rate increases. So this is a screen capture from the FET simulation. And if we play it, we can see the molecules are moving kind of sluggishly, kind of slowly, and we're not going to make a lot of products here because they're not colliding with each other very often. But if we carry out the simulation at a higher temperature, we see that there are a lot more collisions and more products. All right, so the reaction rate increases, and we can see that because there are more frequent collisions and the particles are colliding with more force. So the other thing that ties into this is that the rate constant from your rate laws is temperature dependent. It's not a linear dependence. And so this is related to the number of collisions. And so we see this increase in temperature leading to an increase in reaction rate because the, the rate constant changes dramatically with temperature. If you need to review rate laws, I've got a whole webcast on that, and you might want to go listen to that if you don't know what I'm talking about here. I also wanted to revisit maxwell boltzmann distributions in terms of collision theory, because it all ties in together. We did this in terms of gases. I've got a whole webcast on maxwell boltzmann distributions. All right. We know temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy. And when we're at a higher temperature, well, at any temperature, notice there's this variety of speeds. If you look at the red curve, right, there's a whole distribution. It's not quite a bell curve, but definitely this distribution occurs. And at higher temperatures, the curve gets broader and flatter. But where I really wanted to talk about this was in terms of that activation energy. And that's what the vertical dashed line is showing is the activation energy minimum. So for this particular sample of particles at 450 Kelvin, you can see that there's a small orange area beyond that dashed line that's highlighted. All right, That's the percentage of particles that have more than enough energy. They're over the activation energy minimum. It's a tiny percent. It's only about 1% of the molecules. And this is at 450 Kelvin. Here's the same sample of molecules at over a thousand Kelvin, the activation energy hasn't changed. The minimum hasn't changed, but you see we have a considerably larger fraction of molecules that are over the minimum, right? The area under the curve that's beyond the dashed line is considerably larger. Well, that's kind of important, right? So at a higher temperature, a greater percentage of the reactants are going to be over at or above the activation energy minimum, and therefore the reaction rate is going to increase. So this is a really important idea. The last major topic I wanted to discuss was the idea of catalysts. Now catalysts speed up reaction rates, but they're not consumed. At the end of the reaction, you have the catalyst back in its original form. All right, so here's the potential energy diagram for an uncatalyzed reaction, and we can label its activation energy. But when a catalyst is present for the reaction, what we see is that the activation energy is considerably smaller. It lowers the activation energy. And if it's a lower threshold, a greater fraction of molecules or reactant particles are going to meet that threshold. It's kind of like a test score. If the passing score is a 90, 
maybe not many people will pass it. But if the passing score is a 70, a lot more people will pass it. All right, so it's that kind of an idea. Catalysts lower the threshold for the activation energy minimum. All right, what it doesn't change is the delta H value. All right, the energies of the reactants and the products and their difference remains the same. So I said this before, but it's worth repeating. Because the catalyst has lowered the activation energy, a greater fraction of reactants will meet the activation energy minimum, and therefore the reaction is going to go considerably faster with the presence of a catalyst. I just realized it didn't label the y-axis in these curves. It should be potential energy. But the other thing that I'm going to mention about catalysts is they sometimes change the sequence of steps, also known as the mechanism of the reaction. And so in the uncatalyzed reaction, which I've shown in blue, the catalyzed reaction in yellow, the catalyzed reaction has two little bumps. It's got two activation energies, and there's actually a little intermediate in there. We've got a different, slightly different process to get from reactants to products than we did in the uncatalyzed reaction, and that's not uncommon with catalysts. In your biology classes, you've probably discussed enzymes as biological catalysts. Enzymes are proteins that act as catalysts in biological systems, and there are different models for how enzymes work. This shows enzyme substrate complexes, and they're homogeneous catalysts. The enzyme and the substrate are in the same state of matter. They're often in solution. There can be heterogeneous catalysts as well. There are a number of reactions that occur in the gas phase very slowly. But if there's a metal present, certain metals, they can deposit on the surface of the metal, react, and then leave. The catalytic converter in your car uses platinum, and the gases deposit on the surface of the platinum. The reaction occurs, the gases leave, the platinum's back in its original condition. So these are heterogeneous catalysts. Catalysts are actually really, really important in terms of industry and just biology and everyday life. Well, that's pretty much everything I wanted to say about collision theory today. We know that reactants must collide in order to react. They must collide with the right orientation, whatever it is for that reaction, and enough energy to react. They must meet both conditions or nothing's going to happen. The particles will just separate. We can talk about activation energy. They have to have that minimum energy in order to react. They can collide, but if they don't have enough energy, nothing's going to happen. And we can describe this with potential energy diagrams. We can show the transition state in the activated complex and diagram this. Reaction rates increase with increasing temperature, concentration, and surface area. It's all about having more collisions between the reactant particles. And catalysts increase the reaction rates, but then are recovered in their original form. If you found this helpful, please subscribe to my channel and leave a comment. Learn chemistry every day, folks. It's the path to success.